Thank you, Beth. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Before I answer the question, do cover crops pay, I want to acknowledge SARE for this funding opportunity. And as you're going to learn, I myself am also a farmer, and I've had three farmer grants, and I highly encourage you farmers to take advantage of the farmer, of the, the farmer rancher grants. And the reason is that it'll allow you to try something on your farm that you may not otherwise try. And there's no financial risk to it because they pay for everything. And actually, you get paid to experiment on your farm. So that's, a, that's kind of a nice thing. The other thing I want to do just before uh, we answer this question is I want to talk about my, uh, my employer, the Michael Fields Institute. All right, so we're a nonprofit located in southeast Wisconsin, and we work in the area of sustainable agriculture. We have three program areas. We have an education program. We have a policy program and a research program of which I am the director. <clears throat> the education and the research programs work regionally. The uh, policy program works both at the state level and the federal level, and that's really important. They work in a broader coalition, and really what they do there in the policy area is try to increase funding for conservation programs, but also for the SARE program. And the funding has gone up quite a bit in the last couple of years because of the work of this group. So <clears throat> we're a small shop. We've got nine employees, nine core employees, and then we have casual employees and seasonal labor and that kind of thing. But we can't move the world with just nine people. So one of our operating models is to work in partnership. So listed here, are the people that I work with. I work with a whole range of folks from um, NGOs. So I work with Nature Conservancy. I do a lot of work with the university, both campus-based researchers as well as county extension agents, several agencies within the state. But most importantly, I work with farmers and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So here's our website and I invite you to, to look at our website. We have a lot of resources on there. All my research gets written up in research briefs which jump to the, to the point. They give you the recommendations. And today's presentation, we were told um, in our instructions, plan for 20 to 100 people. Well, it's kind of hard to make handouts, and I'm glad I didn't make 100 handouts. So um, that's posted under the, the research tab. <clears throat> so I want to talk just a little bit about my research areas and then focus on the, uh, the economic components. So in addition to our organic corn breeding program, we have an organic transition research project going on right now. We just, through a generous gift, bought a new farm, a 200 acre farm, that's this picture right up here. And um, we transitioned to organic. We purchased it from Nature Conservancy. One of the requirements was that we switch to organic. So I thought, well, that's great. If we're gonna transition, let's put out a study but we're not looking at transition per se, we're looking at the effect on long-term organic production. So that's ongoing. We are in our second year of doing industrial hemp research. I've spent the last 30 years doing cover crop best management practice research, trying to come up with a set of recommendations that farmers can use so that, <clears throat> and it's tailored for first year, uh, for people that are trying cover crops for the first time. So these recommendations hopefully will help them have a better chance of succeeding. And that's really important because survey after survey after survey says that if a farmer has a bad experience the first time, they're probably not gonna continue with cover crops. So, and if they're not gonna continue, we're not gonna get adoption. So we're trying to help people be successful. <clears throat> the one I'm gonna focus on today is economics. So I've had economic components in all my research but what we're really focusing on is this right here, the gap between the yield of a crop that follows a cover crop and that that doesn't. So this is some research that we've been conducting in southern Wisconsin, looking at particularly the nitrogen credit for corn following a cover crop. And so we were so fo solely focused on that nitrogen credit that we missed the bigger picture, which is the yield advantage to having the cover crop. In this particular site here, 25 bushel extra yield for just having the cover crop. Plus I got the 55 pound nitrogen credit. So Sarah and the Conservation Technology Information Center have been tracking this through farmer surveys. So the survey data that I based my proposal on for um, 
this project was 2012 through 16. And you see the range of um, corn yield 1.9 to 9.6%. That's substantial. Soybeans 2.8 to 11.6. Just for having the cover crop, never mind nutrient savings or the ability to harvest it as forage and what have you. So that's huge. And that's the genesis of this project here. So our project has two objectives. One is to document the economic impact of cover cropping on the farm's bottom line, and then to expand our learning circle. So we've got a group of people who have been meeting on a regular basis, very informally. It's in a farm shop at the end of the day after <clears throat> or over several beers. And uh, I mean, that's, that's when the conversation flows freely. Anyway, our group, there's four of us. We are all longtime no-tillers. We are all longtime cover crop users. We farm very fragile soils in southeast Wisconsin. Like I said, we've met informally for years. And the last thing to say is two of the members participate in formal outreach of my research program. So here's an example of the, the highly erodible soil. And believe it or not, this is the flattest field of all my project fields. And you see how it rolls. If you look at the back of the photo there, you see that ridge. That's the terminal moraine. That's where the last glacier stopped. Three of the farmers farm on the north side. They have very light soils, highly erosive soils. I'm on the other side, and I've got very thin topsoil over gravel. My grandparents made more money with their gravel pit than they did farming. So here's our group. There's four of us. This guy here, Tom Novak, he is the linchpin. He's the one that keeps the group moving. And he does two things. He's got a farm, and he and his wife uh, run the farm, and they grow pumpkins. They've got 20 acres of pumpkins. They have a retail farm or a retail store on the farm, and they also have wholesale accounts. But that's his after-school job. He also is a crop consultant, and this is key. He's got 25 clients, and he's on. He's got management control or management influence over 15 to 16,000 acres. So that's huge. The next is Tom, or sorry, Nick, Nick Caw. He farms a little more acreage. He's got corn, soybeans, wheat, and hay. His big <clears throat> enterprise is the hay. He's got uh, custom dairy farmers that he grows hay on contract for, and so that's his focus. And the same can be said for Tom Burlingham. Uh, he's got a little smaller farm, but it's the same crops. I don't have a picture of Tom. He's got a face for radio. You don't need a picture of me because I'm sitting up here. My day job is research director, but I also farm and I grow corn, soybeans, and wheat. I haven't grown much wheat lately because I get tired of giving it away at the elevator when I, when I run it in. So like I said, we're highly interconnected. So Tom, the crop consultant, works with the other three farmers in the group. Nick, when he's not growing hay, works for Tom, writing nutrient management plans. These two spend a lot of time together. They send me a lot of these paired up selfies. And uh, if you look at them closely, they spend so much time together, they're starting to look like each other, just like old time spouse or long time spouses do. One of them's got to shave or one of them's got to grow a, a beard and then they'd really look alike. And uh, Tom here, he's the one that hosts our, um, <clears throat> hosts our meetings in his farm shop. The other thing I should say is that um, I now do statistical analysis for free for Tom because he does on-farm trials. And I learned during the course of this trial, and I'm way off script here, that Nick there is a distant relative of mine. So our project design is really simple, with or without cover crop. The farmers manage it the way they want to manage it, and we just have at it. We track what they do. We take agronomic measurements, so we measure cover crop biomass yield and residue uh, soil nitrate to see what the impact of the cover crop was on saving nutrients in the system, and then primary crop yield. So I'm in charge of doing all of this. And then for the economics, they provide me with their actual um, costs, their input costs, and what they contracted the grain for, and that's how we come up with the economic analysis. So here's an example of one of our sites. Um, this is Nick's, this is in Oak Hill. Um, this is winter rye following soybean. And so this goes to corn. You look at the above ground biomass and there's a picture of it here, 400 pounds of biomass, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you look at the residue cover, 39%, that's huge for preventing erosion. 
This picture was taken at the end of April, and this is a period we call, in Wisconsin, we call it the ugly 90. Those are the months of April, May, and June when we have the most soil erosion going on. So if we have green cover there, we can prevent or at least reduce that soil erosion. Uh, you can see from the nitrate data, we are able to drive down nitrate, even though we've got um, relatively low yields there. Most importantly to our study, corn yield response, 9.9 .9 acre or 9.9 .9 bushels per acre. So that's a uh, that's substantial. So here's some pictures um, showing our strip trials. So this is harvest from this last fall. You can see the nature of the soils and the strips. Uh, all our farmers use GPS to guide them, so it's real easy to find our strips. And there's a yield map there. Um, in the so I show this slide because it shows um, the magnitude of the strip trial harvest. So we use weigh wagons to measure the yield, and that gets dumped into the combine. I tell my board, this is my pet project. Why is it my pet project? Because I get to drive the semi from field to field. That's the only time a year a few farmers guess. Great, he got to drive a uh, semi. No, it's huge for me because it's the only time of year. Um, and so these are pictures of the various things. The way wagon, if you're not familiar with, um, sorry, the grain gets, gets dumped into there. It's got a scale on it, which you see right here. I take samples. I get moisture, bushel weight, and that kind of thing. And then we dump the grain into the, uh, the semi. So let's jump to the chase. So I've got 10 cases so far. I just completed the second year of agronomic me measurements. 10 cases, we have had positive yield response in eight of the 10. Unfortunately, only two of them, and these are the ones with the stars, are significantly, statistically significant. So as a scientist sitting up here in front of you, I'm not supposed to talk about it anymore because the difference wasn't significant. You tell a farmer who got 9.9 .9 bushel of additional yield just to the cover crop that that's not significant. So we transform the data by looking at the economics and all of a sudden I can talk about it all I want. And you're all farmers, so I can talk about it anyway. Of course, Dean's a scientist, so and he's smiling. So our economic analysis is real simple. We use partial budgeting. We don't make any assumptions. We look just at the change from one system to another. So I showed you we have additional yield in eight of the 10 cases. That additional yield is not free. You have to dry it, you have to haul it, and you have to account for the nutrients that are removed from the soil because you have to replace that. So keep that in mind, it's not free yield. Looking at the system, when we're looking at the cost, the additional cost to the cover crop, we have what we call constant costs, and these are the costs associated with the cover crop. So it's the cover crop seed, it's the cover crop management, establishment, additional chemical if we need to terminate it, and also um, interest. And interest is huge because in a couple of these systems, we're planning in March or July of one year, and we're waiting until November the following year to collect income off of that. You all know interest rates are going up. My operating note right now is at 7%, so I pay particular attention to interest. The constant costs are there regardless of the yield response. So then we have the yield dependent costs, which are down here, and those are the drying charges, the hauling charges, and nutrient removal. Here's the model. It's real simple. Return to cover crop is equal to the additional income, so that's yield times price, less the constant cost, so all the costs related to the cover crop, less the yield dependent cost, so the removal and the hauling and that kind of thing. Before I show you the data, and I've just got one summary slide to show all of it, <clears throat> I want to say, and you all know this, we are operating in a period of very depressed crop prices and our input prices are at a moderate level. So that's kind of the, um, the environment we're operating in. We're going to complete this um, next year. We're going to take all the data and I'm going to play what ifs with it. So I'm going to take it back six to 12 years ago when commodity prices were way up here, and of course, input prices were way up there, but see what the difference is. But just keep that in mind when I show you the, uh, the data here. Survey says, here's our economic data. I've got nine cases here. The, uh, the huge significant uh, increase, the 18 bushel increase, I don't have the financial information back from the farmer yet, so I can't present that. I guarantee it will be positive. 
So here's the system, the cover crop system. Most of the farmers are using winter rye uh, before the, the next crop. This is the uh, response crop. Most cases it's corn, but last year we did have two soybean. So here's our yield increase and expressed as a percent. So across these nine sites you see right here, we averaged 2.3% yield increase. So that's pretty good. Run the numbers, what happens? In nine, in eight of nine cases, we lost money. Two of them, um, well, let's look at the positive first. Nick here with uh, corn after, after rye, he was able to uh, increase per acre $5. So that's, uh, that's reasonably good. Uh, some of the cases lost a tremendous amount of money. This one here and this one here, 59.30 an acre. That's on my farm. Not only did I get no yield response, I also didn't get a nitrogen credit. So I was just investing in soil health and in um, um, <clears throat> protecting the soil. So anyway, <clears throat> that's the case there. So it doesn't look that good given, given the, uh, the market conditions right now. So my spreadsheets allow me to play what ifs. So I can set either the price or the yield to different levels to come up with a break-even level. So when we look at price, that's this column right here. In the case of Nick, he could have sold his corn for a lot less than he did and still break even. So he made, he made a profit. The rest of us lost money, but if you look at the prices, these two cases here, that's within the realm of um, possibility, even in today's current market environment for someone that's really aggressive with forward contracting and pays close attention to the markets. The rest of them are out of the realm. And look at this one here, the yield response of uh, soybean, prices would have to go up to almost $40 a bushel. That's never gonna happen. That doesn't even happen after we have a na national drought. So uh, forget it there. Take home point from that is we're not gonna make it on price we need to look at the yield response. So here's the break-even yield response in this column, both as bushel per acre, but then as a percent. And averaged over all our sites, we have to get 5.2. When I'm done with this project, I'm gonna pool all the data and I'm gonna look where we got the best yield response and tease it apart and figure out what happened at that site year to let that farmer capture that kind of yield increase. So I showed this to my group over a couple of beers, and you know what they said? Jim, so what? The cooperators were very quick to point out that that yield increase reduces the net cost of cover cropping, and that's shown in this table here. So by case, this is the actual cost of the cover crop, I'm spending way too much money on my cover crop. That's take home message number two. We need to cheapen up our cover crop as much as possible. But when you take the yield increase and then translate that to the net cost for the cover crop, you can see that we can drive that thing down. Here's the average down here. Now the two high cost systems, they kind of drive that average up a little bit, but it's the same for both the actual and the net. And we can cut with that yield response we can cut our cover crop cost roughly in half. And look at these, five, six dollars an acre. That's huge for doing the right thing, protecting your soil. The other thing that I should say, well, let me, let me, let, me let the cooperators speak for me. So I asked them about this and uh, I got some candid responses. This one here is verbatim, that the investment in the cover crop, keeping the soil and nutrients in place is worth it, even on rental ground. So there's two key components in there. A lot of surveys say that farmers that grow cover crops will do it on land that they own. They will not make the investment in improving soil on rental ground. And part of the reason for that is rental ground changes operators back and forth, you know, people all bid each other. And so they don't wanna make that investment. The other point is keeping the soil and nutrients in place. In my study here, we don't account for nutrient retention or any of the other benefits. So these are probably, the numbers I'm showing you are the worst case scenario. The other quote, and I really clean this one up, <clears throat> is it covers 
allow us to farm the way we want to. So if you grow certain crops, if you need to uh, meet conservation compliance, soybeans on these types of soils, not allowed. Winter wheat, if you harvest a straw, not allowed. By putting the cover crop in, they can do whatever they want. Giddy up. <clears throat> so um, these guys are all hardcore cover croppers. This guy, Tom Burlingham, he does not want a, a, a bare acre on his farm. So I set up a trial for my nitrogen credit, or a site with my nitrogen crediting where I grew red clover. So I had fallow strips in there. You look at the field, see the headlands back there. He's got his summer mix um, back there. The rest of the field had summer mix on it. He didn't want my control strips, the fallow strips. So he, uh, he planted them all with his summer mix. That totally messed up my trial. So I said, all right, Tom, I'm gonna fix your wagon. So I compared his cover crop using actual cost and return to mine. Guess who won? I can't wait to share this with the group and I'm not gonna share it with him alone. I'm gonna share it with the group because he does a lot of bragging on it. I'm gonna jump to the chase. I beat him by $36 an acre, which is huge. And I also, we had a nitrogen credit in this one. So this is a nitrogen rate trial. <clears throat> complicated there's like tw there's 12 yeah um, that's on my website so Michael Fields just Google Michael Fields and under resources you'll see it's got the got the mix in there it's quite a mix sunflowers and uh, there's little stuff growing down low and what have you anyway so our learning circle so we one of our objectives was to expand our our larger group um, we weren't able to do that. We were supposed to do that last year. Last year was a really difficult year in the upper Midwest and in Wisconsin for sure. Um, we had to sit out April and part of May because of rain and snow. I planted uh, corn two weeks after the snow melted, which is phenomenal, but we got behind. So the hay guys, they got behind on their hay, so they had to work hard to catch up. Tom got behind on his crop scouting, so we weren't allowed, or we, we functionally, we just couldn't, couldn't expand our group. So what we're gonna do this next year is have formal outreach where we're gonna invite in Tom's clients. That's huge because we have, um, he, he knows them well, and so that's kind of leverage to get them in. And so we're gonna have formal, well, how formal can a twilight meeting be especially when you're drinking beer, but we're gonna rotate between our farms and each of us is gonna talk about our experiences. We're gonna collect one more year of data and so then I'll have uh, 18 total site years by the end and then invite the, the growers in and we will present the data to them. And now here's the really cool thing about our project because Tom is writing their crop management plans he knows what they're planting. So this gives us a mechanism, gives us a, at least I didn't hit the kill button, a mechanism to track long-term adoption. 